for questions to the Executive Office. We start with a list of questions. I call on Mrs. Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To ask the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to outline any discussions they have had with the Department for exiting the European Union. Question one. Speaker, following the recent debate in the Assembly, the Deputy First Minister and I wrote to Secretary of State Barclay to advise that the Assembly had not agreed that the United Kingdom Government should legislate on its behalf in relation to aspects of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. We also took the opportunity to highlight that we will be engaging with the Government to ensure that the commitments around unfettered access in the New Decade New Approach Agreement are fulfilled. We also expressed our concern that the UK Government was in breach of the Sewell Convention under which they should not normally legislate on devolved matters here without this Assembly's consent. Our junior ministers also highlighted the need for commitments around unfettered access to be delivered when they attended the EU Exit Operations Cabinet Committee, which is chaired by the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, the Right Honourable Michael Gove, MP. At last week's JMCEN meeting, the Deputy First Minister and I again explained the importance of unfettered access for our businesses within the UK internal market and a commitment was given that there should be a dedicated work stream to take forward issues relating to the protocol. Aside from ministerial level engagement, I am aware that my officials and officials from other departments are consistently articulating our needs to their colleagues in Whitehall. Members will be well aware that there have been contradictory statements by the UK Government and the European Commission on the implications of the protocol for the movements of goods from GB to Northern Ireland. The Deputy First Minister and I have written to the Prime Minister, pointing out that on the face of it, the protocol and statements from the European Commission seem to create legal obligations to apply checks that would fall on us as a devolved administration, and asking for urgent clarification on his Government's plan on this point. Ensuring the freest possible movement of goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, as well as unfettered access of Northern Ireland goods to Great Britain, is a top priority for us given the integrated nature of supply chains. It is also important to ensure that Northern Ireland businesses remain competitive and that costs for consumers do not rise. I can assure the member that we will continue to ensure our requirements around unfettered access, competitiveness and the integrated nature of our economy are understood right across the UK Government. Supplementary, Mrs Rosemary Barton. So, uh First, First Minister, are Northern Ireland businesses and farms going to continue under the EU regulations? As the Member is aware, uh, we are leaving the European Union in a different way insofar as the single re market regulations will continue to apply to Northern Ireland. Uh, what we want to find out is whether that means that there are going to be checks uh, coming from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. It's very important that we understand the nature of those. Uh, to make sure that uh, we have that unfettered access that has been promised uh, and that there are ways in which we can communicate what we need for the Northern Ireland economy through the many JMC processes that have been put in place. Call it Matthew O'Toole. Mr Speaker, um, the First Minister is correct that um, Brexit and the delivery of the Northern Ireland Protocol in the next year, in fact in the next eight months, is going to be completely critical to businesses and households here. So can I ask her whether she is satisfied that the Northern Ireland Civil Service is adequately resourced to deal with the extraordinary complexity of implementing this novel protocol and ask for an update on that resourcing and, and attention that her and the Deputy First Minister are giving to it? I thank the member for his question. And can I put on record actually my thanks to the Civil Service who took up uh, the burden of actually representing Northern Ireland at a lot of the Joint Ministerial Councils meetings when we didn't have an executive and assembly in place. Obviously it was a, a difficult job for them to uh, undertake actually because um, for those of us who know there are many civil servants who can't take uh, political opinions on these issues and they just had to play it with a very straight bat. So, I want to put on record my thanks uh, to David Sterling and his team, Andrew McCormick, for the work which they did. In relation to the resourcing going forward, it's obviously something that the Deputy First Minister and I will be keeping a close eye on. We decided to go to Cardiff ourselves uh, last week because we wanted to make sure that we were fully up to date 
with what was going on in relation to the discussions. Uh, there was quite a robust uh, discussion, I think it's fair to say, uh, between the devolved administrations and the Westminster government. We will continue to keep uh, a keen eye ourselves on this matter uh, so that we can be supported by our civil servants. And if there's a need for more resource, we will certainly put it in place. Call Kelly Armstrong. Much, Mr. Speaker, um, and thank the First Minister, um, who has mentioned about the trade sector, but the service sector also imports and exports. What consideration and discussion has the Minister had um, with interest to the service sector under Brexit? Well, she will know we rely on the Department for the Economy to give us a, a breakdown of the different uh, sectors. We have received uh, from our Economy Minister a breakdown uh, of the different sectors and. Uh, just looking at the sectors, of course, the, the goods sector, the manufacturing sector, is the most important in terms of volume. Uh, but we also realise that the services sector will be very important as well, and we haven't forgotten about that. And indeed, we will, at our first subgroup meeting tomorrow on Brexit, be looking at the way ahead in relation to all of these matters. I call Linda Dillon. Question two, First Minister. Thank you very much. And firstly, I want to pay tribute to all the hard work of the campaigners on this issue. This has been a long uh, and a difficult journey, and it was their commitment that has got us to this point today. This process took too long, yet I am also pleased for the victims of this terrible abuse that we have got to this point. It is planned that the Historical Institutional Abuse Redress Board application process will be open to victims and survivors at the end of March 2020. The Redress Board multidisciplinary panels will be available to sit from the end of April, with the first approved awards to follow shortly thereafter. Work to deliver on these challenging timescales is proceeding at pace. First Minister also confirm where exactly the money is coming from because that's some of the concern that has come to me from the, the victim sector. Whilst we've been given guarantees that it's going to happen and reassurances that the money is there, we have no actual detail of where that money is coming from. Well, can I say to the member, I, I want to reassure uh, those victims that the money will have to be found uh, because we have given a commitment that we will follow through. Uh, on this report and the uh, many recommendations that were put in place, and we intend to do that. Uh, we will engage not only uh, with the Westminster government, but also with the many institutions um, that have been involved throughout the years on this issue. I think it's incumbent upon those institutions to step forward as well, um, not only in a moral way, but indeed in terms of the financial redress as well, and that's something we will be continuing to take up. Call Colin McGrath. Mr. Speaker, uh, could the First Minister give an update on the appointment of the Commissioner for Survivors of Childhood Institutional Abuse? Yes, indeed. And uh, we are in the process of doing that. And if he bears with me, I will just get him the details of that. Uh, so the role uh, of that Commissioner, not only there to assist victims and survivors through the redress pro process, but also to examine the area of support services um, available. Uh, work is ongoing uh, to appoint that Commissioner and um, the Interim Advocate continues in the absence of the Commissioner. Um, the public appointments competition for the post um, will be launched shortly. Uh, it usually takes about three to six months after the appointment is advertised for, so uh, I would presume then once the appointments process starts it will be anything between three to six months to the Commissioners in place. Call Joanne Bonding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, the First Minister, what engagement has there been with the institutions and religious orders regarding their contribution to funding the costs, and also if the Executive Office will make representations to have the Concora files opened in circumstances where the inquiry found no state collusion? 2085 and 2060 seems excessive, and would mean the victims of this depravity would likely not live to see the files opened. I want to thank the member for her question. Um, in terms of the first part of her uh, question, uh, we uh, personally, the First and Deputy First Ministers, want to engage directly with the institutions. The head of the civil service uh, wrote to six of the institutions on the 25th of November uh, about how we may share costs and also to make records available 
uh, from those institutions, but uh, both the Deputy First Minister and I believe that it would send a strong message if we both engaged with the institutions as well, and we intend to do that. Uh, in terms of uh, the latter issue which the member has raised, uh, as she knows, uh, the inquiry did devote um, a number of days of oral hearings to look in a rigorous way at what was going on in the Concora Boys' Home. Um, and the Hart report detailed a range of systems failings leading to uh, systematic uh, abuse by authorities and staff. And for those victims um, and survivors of historical institutional abuse from Kinkora, it is important to emphasise that they can make applications uh, to the Redress Board for compensation. And as I've said, hopefully that will be in place by March of 2020. In relation to the other issue, uh, I'm certainly happy for officials or indeed uh, for myself to engage with the member in relation to the other very specific issue she raises about the opening of files. I call Jerry Kelly. For Morgan John Corley, chest three, uh, question three, please. Uh, as an executive, we are very mindful of the need for timely and effective implementation of the New Decade New Approach Agreement. The commitments in the agreement are a challenging and ambitious programme, requiring effective governance arrangements to ensure delivery. Officials will bring forward proposals for the establishment of a dedicated programme to coordinate and drive forward this work in a formal and a structured way. Uh, go on, biggest lesson, Ira, uh, as in regression. Um, the Minister will know that, like as all, that uh, agreements are one thing and implementation is entirely different purposes. And so I hope that the uh, First and Deputy First Minister will bring regular reports in terms of implementation and the timescales that you, you alluded to in your answer. Well, uh, Annex F, actually, of the document itself, lays out uh, the arrangements for monitoring uh, the implementation of the uh, agreement. Uh, because I think there is a, an acknowledgement that, just as the member has indicated, it's one thing to have an agreement, it's another thing to actually have the implementation uh, of that agreement, uh, and therefore there is a need to have uh, implementation review meetings, which will include uh, the Northern Ireland Executive Party leaders. Uh, there will be quarterly meetings, with the first meeting held. Uh, it was meant to be before the end of January, but as we are only up and running, I would imagine that will happen now in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then we will look at an implementation program uh, and timetable to be agreed at that meeting. Uh, of course, the UK government and the Irish government will be involved as appropriate, according to the three-stranded uh, approach. And then quarterly updates on progress will be published. And I think that's important as well in terms of openness and transparency that we actually publish uh, the implementation of the agreement. I call Jim Allister. It's certainly a new decade, but does the First Minister really think it's a new approach? Does she really think that her partner in government, Sinn Féin, is committed to making Northern Ireland work as a part of the United Kingdom? Or is the real commitment to use these institutions as a stepping stone with the hope and expectation that before this decade is out, they can progress the extraction of the United Kingdom of Northern Ireland from the United Kingdom even further. Well, can I say to the member that everyone has their own political philosophies as to where they would like to see Northern Ireland in 10 uh, years' time? I think he knows very keenly that the Deputy First Minister and I would have different views in relation to where we would like to see Northern Ireland, but I think in terms of the common ground, what we want to see happening is working to deal with uh, the issues identified in the New Decade New Approach document, he will know that that concentrates on health, it looks at education, the fact that we need more and better jobs, we need to look at our infrastructure. It is important that we focus on what unites the people of Northern Ireland, and what unites the people of Northern Ireland is that they want to see a functioning executive and one which delivers for all of its people. I call Doug Beatty. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Given the Minister's um, freshly articulated concerns about legacy proposals within the Stormont House Agreement, um, can I ask the Minister if she was as surprised as the Ulster Unionist Party um, when it was contained within this deal? 
Well, can I say to the member, I always find it helpful when we're talking about documents that we go back to the original document, and I have before me the Stormont House Agreement, um, and in that agreement, at paragraph 30, it says that the body will take forward outstanding cases from the HET process and the legacy work of the police ombudsman for Northern Ireland. Uh, part of the difficulty um, at the moment is that the HIU has lost uh, the confidence of victims and survivors. Uh, that concerns me greatly. Uh, and so uh, in my capacity as DUP leader, I wrote to the Secretary of State about that matter last week. It is important uh, when you look at the new decade, new approach document, it talks about the fact that there needs to be an intensive process of engagement. I think we do need an intensive process of engagement because it is important that we deal with legacy. We cannot allow it to continue to be an open wound in Northern Ireland. Legacy needs to be dealt with and it needs to be dealt with in a way that uh, everyone feels a part of it and that everybody has a stake in the process. I call Kiva Archibald. Maiga can call you Kestia Burakahar. Question four, please. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer questions four, 12, and 13 uh, together. All members will appreciate that ensuring Northern Ireland's interests are properly represented as we move forward through the next stage of Brexit negotiations is of paramount importance to us. The Executive Subcommittee on Brexit Issues will be a key structure in the coordination and development of our response. The Deputy First Minister and I have tabled proposals on the subcommittee to executive colleagues and I am pleased to advise the House that the executive agreed to the establishment of the subcommittee and approved its terms of reference. A copy of the terms of reference will be placed in the library. But in summary, the committee will support the executive by providing a forum for collective discussion and consideration of the implications of EU exit on Northern Ireland in relation to influencing negotiations. It will also agree Northern Ireland policy positions on devolved responsibilities for consideration and decision making by the UK Government and Joint Committee, as well as developing proposals to maximise our influence in any opportunities arising from the withdrawal agreement, including the Northern Ireland Protocol. It would also commission an assessment of the impact on the institutions and on relationships north-south and east-west. The subcommittee will be chaired by the Deputy First Minister and myself, and the other core members are the Minister for the, uh, the, Minister for the Economy, the Minister of Finance, the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, the Minister for Infrastructure, the Minister of Justice and the Minister of Health. These are the ministers of the department most greatly impacted by Brexit, and this membership satisfies the commitment in the New Decade New Approach Agreement that all parties on the executive should have representation. Other ministers can be invited to attend should items of particular interest to their portfolio be discussed. It is intended that the first meeting of the subcommittee will be held tomorrow, and I am confident that the wide-ranging membership of this subcommittee will allow us to consider Brexit in a holistic way. Supplementary, Kiva Archibald. Um, I thank the Minister for her response. Um, on Friday afternoon, I, I met with Border Communities Against Brexit, um, and they were keen to emphasise the need to um, engage with stakeholders in the next phase of the, the negotiations. So I was wondering if the Minister could advise <coughs> what measures will be put in place to ensure that sectors can input into the work of the subcommittee. Well, as we're only having uh, our first uh, meeting proper tomorrow, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would imagine this is one of the issues that will come up, how we engage with other stakeholders, uh, experts, uh, people who want to send us information in relation to how they see matters developing, uh, as well as, of course, looking at our own agenda for how we move forward. So I'm sure that that'll be something that we will consider at the subcommittee. Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Speaker. Can the First Minister uh, and Deputy First Minister, um, can, can they, you've talked about, sorry, you've talked about um, engaging with um, other sectors, et cetera, throughout, throughout this process. Is there going to be a formal structure where you are actually getting advice from academics and from businesses in order to um, plot the way forward in, in the coming months? Thank you, Member, for a question. I have no doubt um, that the voice of businesses will be heard as it has been heard right throughout um, this process. 
I want to pay tribute indeed to the way in which um, those involved in businesses, retail sector, CBI, IOD, FSB, Chamber of Commerce, all of those different uh, business organisations who have raised their voice in relation to the many issues that have been raised as a result of our leaving of the European Union. Uh, I have no doubt that we will continue to engage with them. As I say, we have to uh, have our first meeting tomorrow and we will then set out an agenda as to how we intend to engage with all of those people. Steve Egan. May I ask the First Minister and Deputy First Minister uh, if we are, in the Prime Minister's words today, and I pardon for the accent, ready for the great dimensional game of chess limbering up to use nerves and muscles and instincts that this country has not had for half a century? And if so, will he give assurances that they will update this Assembly regularly through the proper channels and not straight to the media of progress? Well, as a member, uh, well, I'm not sure that he is aware, but um, he, should note, he should note that uh, we are here on the floor of the House talking about the setting up of the subcommittee on Brexit. There has been no press release that I'm aware of uh, in relation to that matter. We have our first meeting tomorrow. Uh, the executive committee um, will have scrutiny of the work of the Brexit subcommittee because, of course, the Brexit subcommittee reports back to the executive office which in turn uh, will be scrutinised by the Executive Committee. Uh, and I'm sure that we will be on the floor of the House as well talking about a number of issues because the complex nature of where we are at this moment in time will require us to have ongoing dialogue with many members and with the ministers involved in the Brexit subcommittee as well. We call Ms Michelle McElveen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question five. The Regional Trauma Network is a partnership between the statutory and voluntary sectors aimed at improving access to high-quality trauma services. The Department of Health leads on health and social care aspects. The Executive Office supports the provision of care, support and treatment to victims and survivors. Peace 4 funding secured by the Victims and Survivors Service has supported the establishment of a network of health and wellbeing caseworkers for victims and survivors and will also support the rollout and delivery of the Regional Trauma Network. We hope that phase one of the service will be launched in the coming months. Michelle McElveen, supplementary. Thank the First Minister for her response, and I'm sure she'll join with me in welcoming the financial support which is now being given to those victims who were injured through no fault of their own, something which has been long fought for. With regard to my supplementary, could I ask the First Minister if the Regional Trauma Network, as developed, will meet the requirement and expectation of the Stormont House Agreement? Well, I, I believe that it will. It is a, a network that still continue, continues to be rolled out. I actually was meeting with a victims group in my own constituency on Friday, and they were telling me how there is a continual dialogue between uh, the executive office and the victims groups. I think that that is uh, very good, and I know that there has been some frustration uh, that it hadn't been moving along as quickly as it should have been, but I think in this past couple of months there has been good progress in relation to governance structures, for example. Uh, I think the victims groups uh, still have a number of limited concerns, particularly about exclusivity, um, but we hope that we can work through those difficulties in the coming months so that this regional trauma network can become a real uh, and indeed lasting legacy to all of those who have suffered as a result of violence. I call Meg Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, Ms. McElveen's question describes the Regional Trauma Network uh, as a service for victims and survivors rather than a more general service within the NHS, which is open to all. That is my understanding of its genesis and its purpose. Does the First Minister agree RTN is specifically for victims and survivors of the conflict? Well, I think there's, there's been differing interpretations of the original commitment uh, in the Stormont House Agreement. I've mentioned already that there's ongoing engagement uh, between uh, our own office and indeed many of the victims group as to whether uh, the network should be open to all of those who have significant psychological trauma or be exclusive to uh, victims and, and survivors. I know that you have 
had uh, a very clear view in relation to this issue. I think what we want to do, uh, because of course health have a different view, because they take the view that it is in terms of clinical need rather than a patient's background uh, as to who accesses the, the network. But I think this is something that we need to continue to work on um, to try and find a solution to it, uh, because I think it is important, obviously, that we do find a solution to it and one that victims feel content and happy with. Call Patsy McGlone. Uh, could I ask uh, the First Minister what discussions her department has had with the Irish Government in relation to the provision of regional trauma centres to address the legacy of the conflict across the entire island? Well, I don't have that detail here, Mr Speaker, but I'm more than happy to write to the member in relation to that. Okay. Thank you. Call Linda Dillon. But, um, just in relation to the regional trauma network, and it, it's actually similar, I suppose, in, in nature to the question that, that Mike Nesbitt asked. We have been leading a number of conversations with both TEO and Health, and it was our understanding, I think, at the last meeting that we had with them, that there was some movement in relation to the regional trauma network, not being exclusively for, for those who were injured by the conflict, but first and foremost for those who are injured by the conflict as part of the Stormont House mechanisms. So can we get confirmation that that is how we're going to move forward? Well, it's my understanding. Thank you, Member, for a question. It is my understanding that those conversations are continuing. Um, our department is working closely with the Department of Health uh, and indeed with the Health and Social Care Board and the Victims and Survivors Service mm -hmm. to ensure uh, that the network does deliver on the Stormont House Agreement by increasing access for victims and survivors to mental health services. Uh, which they need. I suppose the issue, and she has identified it, is, is whether it's exclusively for those victims and survivors or whether it's primarily for those victims and survivors. And I think that's an issue that we need to continue to work on. Call Gary Middleton. Question number six, Mr Speaker. I'm very aware of the member's keen interest in this subject and I'm pleased to inform him that the executive this morning agreed to establish what will be known as the Executive Working Group on Mental Wellbeing, Resilience and Suicide Prevention. This takes forward to the next stage, the commitment made by the Executive Committee at its meeting on the 22nd of January. The Deputy First Minister and I will attend meetings of the Working Group. I hope that this, we will be able to contribute um, valuable knowledge from our department's experience of supporting a wide range of programmes which strengthen provision and capacity in this critical area. And the Minister of Health will be convening an early first meeting of the working group. Gary Middleton for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the First and Deputy First Minister for their commitment uh, in this area. Uh, will the First Minister give a commitment that the many mental health experts that we have uh, here in Northern Ireland, that their views uh, will be taken into account uh, in the, the working group and, and its progress as it goes forward? Well, I can certainly say that we'll be listening very carefully to what uh, clinical experts have to say in relation to this issue. I think for those of us um, who do not have the expertise, the reason why the executive committee felt as a whole um, that we needed to send out a very clear message around the fact that we hear the many voices of desperation around mental well-being, the need for resilience, uh, and of course the need for suicide prevention. And we wanted to send that very clear message that we were listening uh, to those voices, but more than that, that we wanted to do something tangible uh, in relation to those issues. So we will, of course, be engaging with experts around these many, many issues. We do, of course, already intervene through programmes through our own office in the Executive Office and indeed through many of the other departments uh, right across Northern Ireland. But there's no doubt um, that we have been struck uh, since the Executive has been reformed about the very real, tangible need uh, to do more in relation to this very important issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would like to welcome the announcement of the Executive Working Group, but could I also ask the Minister um, what consideration she, along with the Deputy First Minister, has given um, to the appointment of a junior Minister for Mental Health and Wellbeing? I thank the member for her question, and it, it is something um, that the Deputy First Minister and I have discussed. Uh, However, we do believe that we should all be champions in relation to this issue. Um, to date, the, the, the suicide prevention um, cross-party group or cross-ministerial group that was in existence uh, on the last occasion that we had an executive was, was in the Department of Health. 
Uh, we felt on this occasion we should have it in the department uh, at the very centre of government uh, to send a strong message that all of the ministers right from first and deputy first ministers right around the executive table were taking this issue of mental well-being very seriously. So that is why we felt it was important to put it in the executive office. Uh, we're not closing our mind to other structures in the future, but this was our first attempt to really send out a message uh, that we wanted to deal with this issue in a meaningful way. That ends the period of time for listed questions. We move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call on uh, Melissa McHugh. Gromagla uh, Concorla is to ask the First Deputy First Minister what measures they will put in place to ensure that our society is welcoming and accommodating to ethnic minorities and new communities in the new context of Brexit. Gromagla. I thank the member for his question. I think the first thing to say to the member is that uh, we are all uh, ambassadors for Northern Ireland as MLAs uh, individually, and it's important uh, that we uh, articulate the views that all of our citizens here, wherever their background is from uh, and who are living here, are very welcome here. And uh, can I say to the member, I was, as I'm sure he was, appalled at the attack in Oma uh, at the weekend. Um, I don't have the full details of it, but it appears to have been a hate crime attack, and it's something that I want to condemn wholeheartedly, because we must do that uh, in order to make sure that people realise that we are a welcoming society here in Northern Ireland, and we value the input of people regardless of where they come from. Melissa McHugh, Sobhan Mabry. Uh, uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, yes, uh, and I too condemn entirely that attack in Oma. Uh, and that we as a nation have always been very welcoming, well known as the nation of the Cade Mail of Falcha. But I ask, also asked uh, of the First Minister, will they uh, look to increasing the budget, maybe to address the issues in, that in relation to this very, very, maybe development problem we are going to have in the future? Well, of course, it's something we keep under review in relation to, to the budget. Um, but I think as well as that, in, in the New Decade, New Approach uh, document, there is to be set up uh, an Office of Identity and Cultural Expression. Uh, that new office uh, will promote cultural pluralism, respect for diversity, including Northern Ireland's ethnic, national, linguistic and faith communities. And I think that that's a very powerful statement in and of itself, that we want to not only recognise the Irish identity, the British identity, but actually those people who are neither identity, but who live here in Northern Ireland, and we want to make sure that they feel welcome. Call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To ask the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, uh, is the Executive Office fully in support of all aspects of the New Decade New Approach deal, including the Irish language legislation and the implementation of the Stormont House Agreement on Legacy? I think I've already uh, indicated uh, that there are some issues that we need to deal with in and around the Stormont House uh, Agreement piece. Uh, there is to be, uh, and I think this is the, the part that concerns the United Kingdom government, um, uh, says as part of the government, that is the United Kingdom government's wider legislative agenda, uh, they are going to start an intensive pro process with the Northern Ireland parties and the Irish government as appropriate to maintain a broad-based consensus on these issues, and I think that's something uh, that we need to be uh, very much alert to and make sure that that happens. Uh, in terms of the Irish language piece, that, of course, is part of Annex E on rights, language and identity. That is in the framework, and I've already mentioned the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression, uh, then the Irish Language Commissioners, and then the British Commissioners. So all of those are in that context. Uh, it's something that we have to recognise um, a mixed space for all of our identities here uh, in Northern Ireland, and certainly that's something uh, that the Executive Office is committed to doing. Rosemary Barton. First Minister, thank you for your answers. Indeed. Uh, can you give me any idea what discussions have taken place within the Executive Office about these issues? Well, as the member will know, uh, we've been in office since the 11th of January. We are setting up I think it was in response to a substantive question from Mr Kelly about the implementation of, of this agreement. We are, will be setting up various uh, processes to make sure that the agreement is implemented, uh, and that's the way we will make sure that things are taken forward. Mr. McLaughlin. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister um, about the small size of the university sector and the shortage of graduates uh, in our labour market uh, and how challenging that is to the economy? Does the First Minister agree and what does she intend to do about it? Well, I think, uh, as the member will be fully aware, uh, this matter was part of the discussions on the run-up to the New Decade New Approach Agreement, uh, and we have uh, committed to expanding university provision at McGee in line with commitments made, uh, and indeed, uh, and I presume it's McGee that she's talking to, um, that's, a, that's a wild guess, um, <laughs> uh, and then, of course, the Graduate Entry Medical School uh, as well, which I think has cross-party support. Uh, as I understand it, to, to take that forward as well. At the Economy Committee uh, last Wednesday, we were advised uh, by a senior civil servant that um, there was not uh, an adequate business case for uh, the expansion of McGee, and it was something that she, she, she very specifically said that there was no business case no funding and actually no desire to, uh, to do it at this time based on the uh, unfinished business with the North Belfast campus and Ulster University. Can I ask the Minister, has she got an opinion in and around this as, as a priority for the Executive going forward? Well, a lot of those issues that the member has raised are, of course, matters for the Minister for the Economy. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, she will come forward in relation to the commitments in the new decade, new approach, and how she's going to deal with those. But also, there are difficulties. Uh, I think the member is aware of those difficulties, um, and those will need to be dealt with. Um, she will also know, uh, particularly from her previous background, that when we go to do anything in government, we will need a business case, and we will need to... Uh, proce process that business case, but I think uh, these are probably matters that are better taken up with the Minister for the Economy. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, Karen Corley. Uh, I'd like to ask the Minister in relation to the role of the North South Ministerial Council in facing up to the challenges presented by Brexit, and, and does she believe that if we approach these matters in a positive manner, both in terms of the North South Ministerial Council uh, and the British Irish Council, that they can be of assistance in dealing with those challenges? I suppose the short answer is yes, um, uh, both North, South and East, West. I mean, the, the new Brexit subcommittee uh, will uh, commission some work on the institutions here in Northern Ireland, but also what's happening North, South and East, West. I think it's important that we have a very clear uh, view in relation to what is happening there. And indeed, uh, he may remember in the last executive at the North, South Ministerial Council, we did have a good discussion in relation to Brexit and moving forward. Uh, I think it is useful to have those conversations. And actually, I am a, a big um, advocate of the fact that we haven't used the British-Irish um, element of the Belfast Agreement in the way that it should have been used, um, possibly because people were uh, meeting up in Europe or whatever. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity now to use the British-Irish Council model to have that engagement between Westminster and Dublin and Belfast and Cardiff and Edinburgh and Leeds as well, and indeed the smaller islands that are a part of the BIC as well. Thank you, Ken Cordia. And I have no difficulty in terms of that response. East West, North South relationships on these islands are vital across a range of issues. Uh, but in, particularly in relation to Brexit, I think it's important that we use our influence wherever we can find it. So wherever that's North South, East West, I have no difficulty with. Yes, and we will use our influence in, in those uh, matters. I think it is also important to say to the members, uh, Mr Speaker, that the Deputy First Minister and I intend to use our influence now that we are able to attend the Joint Ministerial Council meetings again so that we can put forward the specific needs of Northern Ireland, particularly in uh, the context of the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, which will be challenging, and therefore we do need to use all of those processes to make sure that our voice is heard. I call Teberlon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the First Minister, in respect of the, the pension provision for victims and survivors and the Secretary of State's commitment over the weekend on this issue, is she satisfied that there will be sufficient budget provision on an ongoing basis to, to make these payments? Well, I do welcome the fact that these regulations have been laid um, on Friday by the Northern Ireland Office. Uh, as he knows, the regulations provide that a board is established to oversee uh, the scheme and that our own officials are working 
uh, with other departments across government to pro- progress the implementation of the scheme by May of 2020. It is, I have to say, whatever about the money, which I'm going to come to, the deadline actually is very challenging uh, to have uh, all of the uh, architecture in place as well. Uh, in terms of the money, uh, we don't get any extra finances uh, from Westminster to deal with this issue. That's why it is something that we intend to continue to raise uh, with the government of Westminster because at present uh, this money will come from the block grant, is my understanding, Mr. Speaker. Trevor Lund, supplementary. Yes, I thank the First Minister for that answer. Um, pension payments, just by their nature, are open ended and difficult to predict. So is there any sort of estimate currently available of the total cost of this scheme going forward? Well, uh, ordinarily, uh, I would say Dominic's right in relation to um, the, the amount, but uh, it has been capped between 2000 and 10000 I understand, in relation to a top-up of perhaps other pensions that people uh, may be already in receipt of. It is difficult to uh, put a figure on uh, the scheme at present because... Of course, we don't know uh, how many people have been suffering from psychological trauma, uh, and therefore these people will have to refer in to this redress board. Uh, So it's something that we will have to keep uh, under consideration as the the scheme becomes live at the end of May. Robbie Butler. Mr Mr. Speaker, would the First and Deputy First Minister uh, in line with their commitment to mental health and well-being. I know you've given a, a recent uh, response there with regard to the call for a, a junior minister for mental health. Would they consider the mental health champion being a role that I'd taken to the health minister previously in, in the last mandate as an independent uh, service rather than us all being just mental health champions? I think uh, all of these things uh, will be considered in our, our new subgroup. Uh, I think there's a, a real willingness Um, to look at all and any ideas that come (coughs) forward uh, as a way to deal with these very serious issues in our society. Um, And we certainly will not pretend to have the monopoly on wisdom when it comes to dealing with what are huge societal issues. We will want to take as much information as we can and then try and deal with, in the context of doing what we can, in the limited budget that we have. And let's be honest, it's not always about budget when we come to deal with these issues. It's about uh, sending out very positive signals about leadership and the fact that we are listening to the concerns that people have. Mr. Butler, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister, for your answer. And I just want to pay uh, uh, my respect to you both for for stepping forward in this and I just ask that you would bring everything that you can in in respect of supporting the Minister for Health in that collegiate approach and can I ask that you make a commitment to do so? We absolutely make the commitment to uh, support the Minister of Health as I've said uh, up until now suicide prevention was led uh, from the Department of Health absolutely nothing wrong with that but what we wanted to do was send out uh, a signal uh, that it was coming from the very centre of government that we were taking this issue very seriously and we look forward to working with Robin and indeed all the other ministers that are coming forward uh, to the subgroup so that we can move ahead. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much uh, Mr Speaker for that. Um, following on from a question previously asked in relation to the announcement at the weekend uh, in relation to the payments for people who are trouble related victims, when does the First Minister believe that the first of those payments will uh, reach the recipients? Well, as I indicated uh, to Mr Lund, we are on a very tight uh, schedule to get the architecture in place by uh, the end of May 2020. We're hoping uh, that we will be able to have applications through by then, and I would hope that that will be mostly a paper-based scheme, um, and therefore there won't be the need to have assessments face-to-face. But in some of the more complex areas, Mr Speaker, we may need to have those, and I listened carefully to what the Commissioner for Victims had to say in relation to that issue this morning, uh, and I very much hope that it will not be an intrusive um, process, uh, but instead it is is as easy as we can make it uh, for those victims and survivors. (coughs) Trevor Clark, supplementary. 
And can I thank the First Minister for her response and raise that? Um, the announcement of the weekend goes some way in restoring confidence of those people who were injured during the troubles as no, through no result of their own. But given that there has been a historical problem with the definition of a victim, is there any further work can be done in relation to that that shows that there is any ambiguity in relation to those who actually perpetrated murder in this country can be dealt with in a different way? Well, I think the member will realise that um, the executive office ministers would have different views in relation to that matter, but undoubtedly each of the political parties will make their views known in relation to the definition of a victim to the Secretary of State because the legislation is actually Westminster-based legislation. I'd ask members to take your leave for a second or two to, before we move on to questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs.